So hello everybody, welcome to our second animal conversation. I will be chairing today's session as a junior fellow of the Animals and Biodiversity Program of the Global Research Network Think Tank. I'm also a PhD candidate in the School of Humanities at Royal Holloway University of London. And um, Today, as I was saying, is our second conversation of the conversation series on animal justice and animal politics. And it will be on race, conservation, and human dominion over animals. Before I introduce our speakers, let me briefly tell a little bit about the structure of our session today. So in the first part, each of our speakers will answer a couple of questions that will serve to introduce some of the key terms in the fields of critical race theory, conservation, and uh, crit critical theory also. Uh, I suppose um, we will have people coming from many different backgrounds. So for you, all those of you who are unfamiliar uh, with these fields, our speakers will, will help and tell us a little bit about some key, te some key terms. I will then gather some of these insights and try to kind of put them together so that we can see a thread of all the insights they will be discussing. And then the second part is going to be pretty open-ended and they will just ask each other whatever they want, if they have any thoughts, any comments, and we'll see what emerges from, from the conversation. Um, I'm very curious about this second part and looking forward to it as well. And then at the end, we'll have 25 minutes, 30 minutes for questions and answers. And the session should end at uh, half past 11 UK time. We have many time zones, so you can convert, but the idea is that it will be one hour and 30 minutes in total, one hour and a half. So that's about the structure. And I will now introduce our wonderful speakers. Let me begin with Claire Jing Kim, who is Professor of Political Science and Asian American Studies at the University of California, Irvine, where she teaches classes on comparative race studies and human animal studies. She received her BA in government from Harvard College and her PhD in political science from Yale University. She has published two books, Pita Fruit, the Politics of Black Korean Conflict in New York City, and Dangerous Crossings, Race, Species, and Nature in a Multicultural Age, for which Dr. Kim won numerous awards. She was also the co-guest editor of a special issue of American Quarterly called Species, Race, Sex in 2013. And Dr. Kim is currently finishing a book entitled Asian Americans in an Anti-Black World and working on a new book, book on students for fair admissions versus Harvard, the case that seeks to end race, con race conscious admissions in US higher education. Um, our second speaker, Dinesh Wadiwell, is senior lecturer in social legal studies and human rights in the Department of Sociology and Social Policy at the University of Sydney. Dinesh's research uh, interests include theories of violence, critical animal studies, and disability rights. He's author of the monograph, The War Against Animals, the co-editor of Foucault and Animals, and his essays have appeared in Cultural Studies Review, Angelaki, New Literary History, and South Atlantic Quarterly. Dines is completing a book exploring the political relations between animals and capitalism, and also developing a new research project exploring the political history of pleasure. Our last speaker, Helen Kopnina, uh, received her PhD from the University of Cambridge in 2002 and is currently employed at Northumbria University as a senior lecturer in sustainable business and also at the Hage University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands, where she coordinates a sustainable business program and conducts research within three main areas, sustainability, environmental education, and biological conservation. Helen is the author of over 200 articles and co-author and co-editor of 17 books. Claire, Dinesh, and Helen, welcome, and many thanks for being with us. It is an honest, honest honor to have you. I'm very happy to have you, so thank you. <laughs> and now, um, well, let us just begin because we have a lot to cover. So 
Um, first, as I was saying, I'm just going to ask two questions to each of you, uh, and um, I will begin with Claire. So as you know, Claire, uh, many animal related fields, we, we were discussing this on the on email, um, have traditionally understood um, racism as discrimination against people whose skin color is not white. In your, in your book, Dangerous Crossings, and your work more generally, you have argued that race is not only a matter of a skin color, but rather a taxonomy of power that splits and fragments. I know that these are quite technical terms, so could you perhaps unpack these insights and also what you mean when you say that race and the species are taxonomies of power? What does that mean? Okay, so race is one of our main ideological inheritances from centuries past. It is a um, not a biological reality, but a socially constructed system of socially constructed meanings. And it has unfolded on a global scale. So we can actually talk about a global racial order or global racial meanings. Um, it emerged in the 1500s, by the 1500s, and was codified over the next few centuries in official discourses, in laws, in uh, slave laws in particular and was used to justify the institution of African slavery and was of course reinforced by that institution. By the 1800s, uh, people were talking about biological racism, right? Um, how race was an immutable biological reality. And um, by the 1900s, really scholars were reaching some form of consensus that, that race does not refer to any kind of fixed biological reality, but is in fact a set of socially constructed meanings that has been used to justify um, domination and exploitation and uh, expropriation over the centuries. So even though we have some sort of rough scholarly consensus that race is a socially constructed idea, um, we're really just still beginning to understand how it works, how it gets reproduced, and how intricate and complex the dynamics are. Um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, who is a scholar of um, who writes on black politics, black issues in the United States and the prison industrial complex. I'm gonna paraphrase one of her definitions of race, um, that it means differential exposure to premature death. Um, and so what I like about this very um, pithy definition of race, pre differential exposure to premature death, is it really brings our attention to the heart of uh, what race does. And ra what race does is define who matters and who doesn't, right? And this, this is why Black Lives Matter um, is called Black Lives Matter. It's, it's calling out the fact that in a racialized system, um, people who are designated as Black um, are seen as not mattering. And, and when we say some people matter and some don't, we need to only look at COVID-19, the impact of this pandemic um, on regions, which regions is it impacting in particular around the world and within countries or within states or even cities which neighborhoods, which areas um, is it impacting the most? Same with climate crisis, ecological crisis. Um, one term that I think is important to think about whenever we talk about race is racial capitalism. So we could look at Cedric Robinson's work on this and many others who have written on um, the articulation of race and capitalism, the articulation of race as a system of meanings and capitalism. Um, and here we can also learn a lot from Dinesh's work. Um, so one sort of um, serviceable definition we could use is race is a centuries old system, pervasive system of meanings that works in tandem with capitalism to designate who matters and who doesn't and who lives and who dies. Um, so in my work, I've been really interested in saying race is not just a dualistic or binary reality. It's not just black and white or black versus non-black or white versus non-white. In fact, you know, there are um, differentiated statuses within um, a racial order. So hence the title and topic of my latest book, Asian Americans in an Anti-Black World, where I'm really looking at um, how do we rethink Asian American history within the United States um, in relation to structural anti-Blackness, by which I mean um, the organization of society and the world around the phobic um, avoidance of and hatred of Blackness. So, borrowing obviously from uh, Frantz Fanon and people who write about Fanon. That's wonderful, Claire. Thank you very much and very succinct and clear. So I was thinking, I will try to find it later, an interview with Circo that the kind of 1500s period, she explains this 
this part quite well. Maybe later I will try to, to find it and copy paste it on the, on the chat. Um, so the second question I wanted to ask, actually thinking of Silco already, was that, um, as you know, in recent years, critical race theories like Afco and Silco with the book Afroism and more recently, racism as well, it's called witchcraft by Afco, and of course your work, you have all sort of argued in tandem, as it were, that racism and animality, I'm, I'm quoting you here, Claire, are interconstituted all the way down. And this argument, since I kind of started to understand it, I'm still working on it, but seems to me crucial and challenges this idea that racism is analogous to a speciesism, which has been a key foundational idea in animal ethics, especially with the work of Peter Singer, of course. So my question is, why are racism and animality interconstituted? And what does that mean? If you could, again, unpack this, because it's quite complex idea. And yes, that's my question. Right. So Silco and AFCO, um, respectively, are, and, and also in their co-authored book, are really great sources of um, theory and information on this topic. So um, if we think, one of the things that race scholars strive to do is convince people who don't think about race that in fact race as a system of meanings is completely pervasive, right? There is nothing in the world that escapes um, racialization. So for example, I know you're gonna talk about and, and talk with Helen about the idea of invasive species and here, you know, that's one example of how we can see um, racial ideas showing up in scientific discourse. Um, so interconstituted all the way down, race and species. So I, I make this argument most fully in my book, um, in, in my article uh, about the killing of the gorilla Harambe in the Cincinnati Zoo in 2016. And so here I really argue that the human, the idea of the human with a capital H, um, was constructed in relation to two main figures, the black, and here I'm deliberately not saying the black person, right? I'm saying, I'm saying an ungendered um, black figure. Um, the human was constructed in relation to the black and in relation to the animal. So the human has always been seen as um, not black and also not animal. And those have been sort of the constitutive features of the human in the last several centuries. So um, over time also these two figures have become blended together. So we see this centuries long association between blackness and apeness, for example, that um, historian Wentham Jordan wrote about. So what I say in my book, Dangerous Crossings, is species is a racial concept and race is a species concept, meaning there is no way to talk about one without the other because they are so inextricably bound together in terms of meaning. So just to give one easy example, if we look at African slavery in the United States, one is struck by how much the racialization of kidnapped captive Africans um, depended upon animalization, right? There's just, if you look at the discourse of the archive um, about how slave owners and others talked about uh, captive Africans, it was all, almost always uh, with a very strong dose of animalization, right? Referencing animals. And slaves themselves, based upon their testimony, understood that they were being treated like animals and had very interesting, complex um, responses to that. So the analogy that you mentioned, for example, that Peter Singer uses saying, you know, let's talk about speciesism as something that is analogous to racism and sexism. The problem with the anal analogizing is that it posits that these things are separate, right? That you can talk about race on its own, you can talk about speciesism on its own, you can talk about sexism on its own. In fact, I think, um, and it's sort of saying, as Peter Singer is wont to do, that we can pursue animal liberation without talking about racial oppression and racial injustice. Um, so my argument really throughout my work has been, we can, if we want to deconstruct the human with a capital H, which I believe many of us are interested in doing in order to save not just animals, but the planet and ourselves, if we want to deconstruct the, the human with a capital H, we have to actually deal with both of the counterparts to the human, right? Both the human defined as not black and the human defined as not animal. Um, and so this is why I think that all of us who are involved in animal and ecological advocacy um, would benefit from thinking about the black liberation struggle and how um, our interests and our, the issues that we care most about 
can um, articulate with or can dovetail with the black liberation struggle. In my mind, when I look around, this is the only and the most capacious framework I see for mobilizing people that takes anti-blackness seriously because many other movements do not or you know strive to but don't necessarily get there. Um, and it's also a, move, a movement that has um, a long history of thinking about what Robin Kelly calls freedom dreams, right? Of envisioning a different kind of world that um, it wants to create. And so if we in animal studies and ecological studies and conservation can critically examine the discourses that we use and the claims that we make um, in relation to structural anti-blackness, in relation to the Black Lives Matter movement, I think that would um, you know, involve a sort of a pretty fundamental re-theorizing of what our collective project is. I think that would be very generative and would respond to this need um, to take seriously anti-blackness as and other forms of racism as well as um, the um, exploitation and objectification of animals. Thank you, Claire. That's wonderful response. Um, okay, so we are now going to move to conservation, even though I think that all these kind of discourses and knowledge systems are interconstituted. Um, and Helen, you are our expert in compassion, compassionate conservation. And I want to ask you first, um, a little bit like with Claire at the beginning, for those um, attendees who are not familiar with the field of conservation biology, could you explain what's conservation and its central prerogatives? And also what does conservation seek to protect as a field, as a discipline? Okay. Well, I came into conservation from a very different background myself, because my background is in social and cultural anthropology, as a matter of fact. So I started with ethnic studies, racial studies, etc. And strangely enough, slowly but surely, I think I've gone quite a long way away from it because actually I found a lot of this literature quite anthropocentric, basically centered on humans. And what I found interesting about the field of biological conservation at first, it seemed to me that it was different, that it actually took animals, but also plants and systems such as ecosystems uh, for, if not an intrinsic value that some of the conservationists assumed those entities or living beings had, but basically uh, seeing a thing like biodiversity not as an abstract term, but something that has to be defended and also on ethical grounds. But just like in the field of anthropology, perhaps, and that's why I started saying that when I'm tired, I'm mild, but now I feel that my mildness might be going away. Uh, I've discovered that there are also many, many different perspectives on uh, conservation. Uh, the more you read about types of conservation that exist now, the more you read about tensions within it. So there's the so-called uh, new conservation that considers that conservation enterprise in itself is more or less something that should benefit especially um, poor, downtrodden, marginalized uh, communities. And otherwise, basically, it shouldn't exist. And I'm just simplifying things very much here. Huh? There's also a kind of critique of neoliberal conservation that is seen by its critics as white colonial enterprise, and uh, these people bring their ideas and impose it upon others, etc. And then there's the ecocentric conservation that actually says what matters is ecosystems and indeed oftentimes evokes the question of intrinsic value. And also some of the conservation recently has been, as you said, um, termed compassionate conservation. That one looks at the interaction between species, habitats, but also individuals. And those individuals, they say, matters. I'm not necessarily a compassionate conservationist. I've gone through many different um, 
stages, I would put it this way. But I'm very much sympathetic to the idea personally of the type of conservation that takes animals, but also plants and habitats seriously. And in a sense, um, quite ironically, and in that I must say, I very much differ from Claire's point of view. I think what we talk about quite a lot in social sciences these days, social sciences concerned with conservation, we just can't get um, beyond ourselves. It's always interspecies. It's about sexism, racism, differences between our own species. And what the especially so-called ecocentric conservation says, we should also place ourselves, all of us, black, white, green, brown, whatever, polka dot, male and female, just realize that we're animals, primates, and there are almost 8 billion of us. And we're rather large, and not all of us are vegan. And it's not like women are nice and caring and vegan, and men, especially white men, are destroying the earth. No, I really think that it's all of us as a human enterprise collectively. Some are more guilty than others, some are less guilty, some consume more, some consume less, some are aware of things, some are not. You can say that poor people, they never have a choice, they don't have the knowledge, they don't have anything. So bushmeat hunting that sometimes destroys the last species pushed to the brink by indeed large colonial enterprises, large um, you know, industrial complex, etc., deforestation that comes from bigger players, but then the last, very last endangered species are sometimes hunted out by uh, even indigenous communities. So I know this is not a very popular view in especially a liberal left that I'm very much part of myself. We're all like that at the universities, I think. But uh, yeah, this is recently something that started really bothering me not looking at ourselves as part of the biological chain anymore, not realizing that it's the sheer mass of our presence that destroys habitats. And with the habitats, it destroys living beings. And that's basically how I see conservation. It's very, very splintered. And what matters to me within it is going back to us human beings, no matter what color, what gender, as just one out of million of other species. I already look forward to the discussion, perhaps. Um, but yes, yeah, so I perhaps just a very brief remark. I just think that one of the that's in part why I wanted to begin from that. That at least what I have read, critical race theory and postcolonial theory also. The idea is that race is not only about skin color, there's something else that is much more all pervasive a kind of knowledge system and set of meanings that is structuring our society in many ways. But well, that will be perhaps for, for later. The, the, my second question, Helen, that, that I wanted to ask you is that, and you know this much better than me, that um, many species are categorizing conservation policy and as well in conservation as an academic discipline as invasive, pest, feral, and the activities of many animals as a threat, literally like threat. So I just wanted to ask you, what is the role that this kind of language and discourse plays in, for conservation policy and also in conservation ethics that it's as well um, quite present also? If you could explain this, please. Yeah, well, um, of course, it's about how we name things partially. Look, I believe that the largest threat to animals, wild animals, domestic animals, is actually human expansion. As I said, it's a structural thing. It has to do with population growth. It has to do with consumption growth. And it's just because we are large omnivores in pretty much biological terms, right? But in what you're asking, that certainly does have to do with more ideological, linguistic areas. And in that, I can meet you all, I think, here. And it, it is indeed the kind of distancing that also was used for, um, well, people of certain 
as we would say, not just skin color, but all kinds of presumptions behind it. Basically, animals were used as curses. They still are. You know, we still uh, describe somebody as a dog or a pig, and obviously it's not a good thing. So when you talk about pests, I mean, obviously what we're talking about is living beings. And if what is meant here is a rat, you know, there are rats in Amsterdam and they're being exterminated. It's not that I personally would love to see rats in my house. In Australia, rats have been known to destroy a lot of marsupials of smaller size, etc. And of course, we can see how problematic they can be on small islands, for example, where you have very fragile ecosystems. But just the way I think how um, our human responsibility, again, is shunned in favor of making those invasive species the scapegoats. Basically, we don't name ourselves invasive species and the cattle that we keep. And all the biomass that we have created of the animals that we eat, we exclude ourselves and all these animals that are occupying larger and larger parts of the planet, pushing away wildlife and basically converting habitats into fields of human food. We're delegating them to the um, basically uh, pests, etc. And I think that excuses any kind of action, and this is not ideological, this is really action, that would actually address what's going on here. Expansion of agriculture, expansion of urban areas, et cetera, et cetera. And then those invasive species are the ones that basically are scapegoats and pay the price for what we, as a nation or as one, one single humanity, do. Thank you, Helen. Um, we will now move to Dinesh before we begin with the open discussion part. And um, the first question I want to ask you, Dines, it uh, relates to your book, The War Against Animals, where you argue that humans have constructed ethics by holding a position of epistemic sovereignty. sovereignty and that this fact has led humans to produce violence against animals in an imaginable and unprecedented scale. I'm kind of paraphrasing you here. So I, I just was wondering whether you could explain your argument and also kind of focus it a little bit already on conservation policy, because I think that it, is, it is assumes a position of epistemic sovereignty as you understand it. But well, perhaps we can get to that later maybe. But so my question is, um, what does it mean to hold a position of epistemic sovereignty? And what does that entail then when we come to construct ethics? Sure, and I don't know whether I use the word epistemic, phrase epistemic sovereignty, but I like it. So thank you, Pablo. Um, I mean, one way to think about it relevant to conservation discourse is who gets to decide. Um, so Helen, I think, just mentioned, I, I, I mean, I have a few thoughts about what Helen just said, but one thing I'd say is that Helen just made the point that we have an assumption that we are removed from various processes and interrelations with non-human animals. And that also we, I mean, we put ourselves in a position to decide, and that's central to much conservation discourse. There's a very famous UK animal welfare uh, scientist called John Webster, and he makes, made this remarkable statement, which really stuck out at me. He said, um, whether we like it or not, we have dominion over animals. And it really struck me because I thought this is actually almost a common sense statement in that it's pervasive in our culture, but completely odd if we think about it. Why do we have dominion over animals and who gave us this right? Um, I'm a political philosopher and particularly interested in concepts of sovereignty. And so one way to think about sovereignty is most constitutions of nation states articulate the sovereign rights of nations and they basically say why states get to do what they do. Many theories of sovereignty um, were described by liberal philosophers as largely involving ideas of a social contract or social compact where supposedly people get together and 
consensually agree to the terms by which a nation is founded. And this is the romantic dream within some liberal philosophy like Rousseau, um, that this is how sovereign rights are constructed. Um, there's another philosopher who was really influential for my book, which is the French philosopher Michel Foucault. And Foucault in his 76, 77 lectures at the College de France um, really takes issue with this idea of sovereignty. And he says, actually, let's be frank about the history of sovereignty. It's about war, it's dispossession, it's slavery, it's fundamental conflict and inequality. And he says, in a sense, the modern state contains within it that history, that origin of absolute violence. But it comes with a particular kind of trick in that it always pretends that this fundamental violence, conflict, war did not exist. Now, of course, this is really fascinating for a range of different ways of thinking about states. So I'm, I'm located here in inner Sydney on Gadigal land, on land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And Australia is a really good example of a country that is a settler colonial nation where sovereignty was taken by force. It is the product of war and inequality. Our government actively pretends that this history did not happen. And we all tell ourselves by the way that we live that this is our land. And so we erase that fact of settler colonial history. Some scholars such as Aileen Morton Robinson, uh, who has a fantastic book called The White Possessive from 2015, uh, make use of this story from Foucault to just say, look, actually, in a sense, every state, every state of sovereignty contains within it fundamental divisions that are formed from this originary violence. I looked at these in the war against animals and sort of said, well, isn't this one way to frame what we did to animals? Right. So one, one way to think about this is first, in a sense, lots of our human relations with animals uh, describe a kind of victory over animals that has happened in that we have enforced our wills over animals in particular kinds of ways through systematic forms of violence that are right before us. In order to affect this sovereignty, we have to develop um, far-reaching and often intense mechanisms of violence that stretch out almost as far as the eye can see, that continually seek to put down animals to quash their resistance in order for them to fulfil our will. And we do so for our own pleasure and right, for our own satisfaction. Finally, there's an epistemic dimension to this. And when I say epistemic, I mean you know, at the system, at the level of knowledge, it shapes how we look at the world. Um, so we believe that we are right and we are justified in what we do. So that, 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 that narrative comes through. And once again, I'm very clearly here drawing on uh, post-colonial and indigenous theorizing um, so, again, Aileen Morton Robinson talks about sovereignty as um, having a kind of word, wide virtue associated with it. So if we look at the history of um, nation states, there's often this idea, or particularly European, uh, that European history, that sovereignty is the expression of what it means to be white, right? That this right, this, I am white and I'm virtuous at the same time. So I'm, in a sense, I think there's something interconnected, and I absolutely agree with Claire, that we can't think through, through these ideas without thinking about the interconnection with histories of race, which help to fabricate how we see species as well. Now, all of this is to lead up to the idea that I put forward in the book that sovereignty precedes ethics. And what I, the point I was trying to make there was that when I read lots of animal ethics, it was almost like these Discussions were happening in an absolute vacuum. And many of the discussions were, what can we ethically do to animals? So what are the things that we can do to animals that we believe are the right ways to treat animals? And they seem to forget that the whole ethical discussion happens after we've already decided that we have a right to have of dominion over animals. Um, and what I argue in the book is that, in a sense, this is how many of the debates around 
our relationships with animals are framed is we assume that we have a right to decide and then ethics becomes the way to condition our decision. Now, all of this, I think, has some bearing on conservation politics in the sense that we've already decided that we have a right to intervene and shape environments. And then we have these, you know, ferocious ethical debates around what conservation looks like, which is basically about how do we condition human sovereignty over animals. Um, so to me, this is, again, it's maybe it's a useful tool to frame how we think about conservation, because to me, the question that we need to ask goes right back to, do we actually have a right to decide? Do we have a right of dominion? And what does this actually mean? It does go to an extent to the points that Helen has made about questioning what anthropocentrism is actually about and, and what are the histories that have framed what I would say is um, a fundamentally European Enlightenment idea that has fundamentally shaped how many people now see the world and organises institutions in particular kinds of ways. Thank you, Dines. Actually, I was convinced that the epistemic sovereignty was yours, but it isn't. I, I Your idea, you've it made it up. It it it. I cannot believe it. Oh my God. Uh, I've assimilated your work so much that I even forget. But anyways, one thing I did want to mention is that uh, people might, some of our people listening to us might be surprised to know that in the Commonwealth of Australian constitution now, in the present, there is an article that says that people can be a kind of, I don't know how to put it, but uh, they can be stripped of their right to vote by beauty of their race. That's in the constitution of Australia now, because sometimes we think that kind of um, colonialism is something from the past, from the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century, but it's still very present even in the constitutions of some countries. And also, of course, it, it, it's all pervasive as well. So just wanted to mention that. And then the last question I, want, I wanted to ask for this part of the, of, the, of the talk, it's about the notion, now this is correct, of epistemic violence. In the relation to the discourse that Helen was discussing in part, so these notions of invasive, pest, feral, the notion of the feral that perhaps might be new for some people because it's sort of quite specific to Australia, New Zealand. So I wanted to ask you, Ines, whether you could explain to us um, what is epistemic violence about and in, in the context in particular of this discourse of the feral, invasive, pest, that kind of thing. Um, sure. And we're going to have to do a bit of a, a little bit of a deep dive into post-colonial theory to get there, if that's okay. So I'm begging everyone's indulgence. Um, I mean, epistemic violence, I would say, is a phrase that comes from uh, um, particularly, as I said, post-colonial theory. And I'd say some of the origins are in the thinker that Claire mentioned, Franz Fanon, um, but also Edward Said and the other figure who I draw on um, prominently in The War Against Animals is Gayatri Spivak, another post-colonial thinker. Um, and Spivak really kind of articulates this. It, it, the most famous place she articulates this is in a very widely read essay called Can the Subaltern Speak? Um, which if, you, if you've read, is, it's a bit of a challenging read, but I still recommend having a look at it. Um, she uses an example to describe what she calls epistemic violence. And I, I'm gonna talk about the example because I think it helps to illustrate how this works. She looks at the Indian practice of widow birding or sutti, um, so it's something that the British colonists found when they came to India in some parts of India. And the British outlawed the practice in the early 1800s. Um, Spivak says there's multiple things going on in this example, and it reveals something about um, who gets to speak and who is silenced by prevailing knowledge discourses. Um, so she looks firstly at the British colonists and she says they come with this white civilizing conceptualization of the world where, as I mentioned, they justify their own sovereignty through a sense of their own virtue. 
she says that the British colonists basically say that what they're trying to do is save Indian women. Um, and she, and Spivak comes up with the now famous, quite economic phrase, white men saving brown women from brown men. Um, the reason I think it's an important phrase is that it's quite central to much critical race theory, this concept, because we see this trope repeated almost everywhere um, in human race relations. Um, and it's part of the kind of racialization, the feature of racialization or the gendered feature of racialization almost everywhere. Spivak also then looks at what the traditional patriarchal Indian culture, what its response was. So in the early 1800s, um, I don't know the exact details, but you know, I think there was a, a, a petition sent by Indian traditionalists to the Privy Council in India and in, in Britain in, in 1930, basically saying, we, we object to you banning widow burning. Um, this is a part of our culture, it's part of our traditional culture. Spivak says, well, this in a way reveals that um, uh, a, a different kind of distortion, which is that uh, the Indian traditionalists, like largely Indian men, were basically saying, quote, the women wanted to die. Um, what Spivak is trying to point out is that someone's voice is missing here. And that's literally the voice of the brown woman. Like Indian women are completely silenced in this whole debate. She also makes the point that there is no space in this knowledge system for the voices or perspectives of these women to be narrated between the, the, the colonizing um, British voice, the knowledge system, and the traditional Hindu patriarchal uh, knowledge system. There's no space for uh, uh, the voices of women to be heard and to be actually made legible. I find this a really fascinating story for thinking about animals, because in my view, we have fundamentally silenced animals through our knowledge systems. And so part of the nature of the kind of construction of species, and again, I'd say that the reason I'm drawing specifically from critical race and post-colonial theory is that this discourse is racialized and we can see different ways in which it, it operates on that, in that vector. Um, the project is to literally silence the other as part of your violence. And so violence operates in this way by silencing the perspective of the other. And worse, not just that, making it appear that the other welcomes is either not, not plus by what you're doing to them, or alternatively actually wants this violence. Um, to them. And so we actually see this spectacle all over the place in relation to human violence towards animals. So you, people may know that you, I'm sure it happens where you are, but around here there's lots of butcher shops with a cartoon image of a pig holding a knife and sometimes even cutting themselves open um, with this look of glee on their face. And you think, what kind of distorted worldview? would imagine that the subject of violence would invite that violence in themselves. But I would say that this is actually a trope of all violence. And we certainly see this in forms of racialized violence, this particular trope that the subject of violence is imagined as actually welcoming and asking for this intervention. The reason I'm going down on this whole terrain is that I think, obviously I think this has fundamental reality for conservation and some of those terms that you mentioned, like the feral animal, um, part, partly it's about what does it mean to categorize certain groups of animals, just literally write them off as um, being a pest or being ex excess or, or purely being a threat, right? So what, what does that mean categorically as an epistemic device? But the other side is, and this is relevant to Spivak's other economic phrase, the women actually wanted to die. I think lots of our knowledge systems actually pretend that animals want to die for us, right? that they don't care whether they are used for us. And certainly I think it's central to our food system. It's central to an extent to lots of conservation discourse that imagines that the animals that we're about to annihilate en masse because we have decided that they are ferals 
um, don't care one way or another and don't have any uh, any perspective that actually matters to us in that decision that we have made. Um, so anyway, I'm sorry for the deep dive into theory, but hopefully that's some useful tools for this sort of discussion. Dr. Baldiness, thank you very much for for your insights. I, I love listening to you. And I was also thinking you were referring to race, but also it came up the idea of, you know, desiring to be, to be to experience violence as it were with the pig cutting uh, herself or himself, sexual violence. It's super present, this kind of discourse as well, because we see here how everything is inter in, in, interconnected, interconstituted. So yeah, I, I just agree with, with what you were saying and thank you again for the explanation it was very illuminating. So my idea was not to gather all of your insights, but I'm rather going to just offer a reading of what I think is doing the, this kind of discourse of invasive past feral threat and what happens with that, trying to draw a little bit with what some of you have been saying. So in a way, when Claire explains in her work that um, race is not only a matter of a skin color, but as a, a taxonomy of power. And I really like this. I'm paraphrasing Claire when she says that race literally splits and fragments. And it creates, if you like, a clear kind divide between those who are inside the moral circle and those who are outside, those who are part of a political community and those who are outsiders. And I hope that you can see how terms like invasive, pest, feral, threat and so on are racial constructs insofar as the discourse establishes clearly that those who are invasive or feral do not belong to the political community. They are outsiders that we should eradicate. And by the way, the language of eradication, literally that language is used in policy documents, legislation, international agreements and so on. So one of the things that Dinesh in his work uh, has argued, is argued as he has explained extensively by the way, is that when we categorize beings as invasive or as a threat, killing those animals appears as not being that bad, if you like. It eases the killing of the animals. It appears as justifiable violence under the guise of civil peaceability. As I'm quoting Dines there. Um, so what is crucial to understand from all this discussion, in my opinion, that's why I was talking of epistemic sovereignty, but perhaps Dines doesn't use that term, is that when we assume a position of sovereignty in terms of having the right to name, having the right to define others as we please, when we assume that position of sovereignty, um, we can then construct an ethics in which we silence others. We say they are those who are invading our space and therefore we can eradicate them. But the question is, who are we to assume that position? of epistemic sovereignty in the first place? And what is the, the justification to construct knowledge systems that turns animals who come for its friendships, living in communities and flourish into invasives to be eradicated? I have never read anywhere a good justification for that. And unless someone can offer a, a sound argument, I just think this is a kind of crucial point that should change the paradigm of conservation, at least in my view but maybe here I'm talking uh, two grand words perhaps, but I do think that th this is a crucial point. And well, maybe we disagree here. I don't know, Helen, what you think, because I know I, you were saying before that maybe you don't hold this position so much, but what I wanted now to do in the second part of the conversation is to ask you first to all of you, whether you have a question that you would like to ask to each other or you have any comments to open the conversation or you'd like to raise, um, raise any um, new topics we have not covered and you think are important and we perhaps have missed them. So please, uh, I, the floor is yours. If things go more or less well, I will not intervene and just let you talk. <laughs> Could, could I pose a question? Oh, it's maybe, it's a thought, and I just, just to pick up on something Helen raised. Um, so I think Helen um, has put the view that in a sense, some of the, the challenges before us, maybe as a planet, um, or maybe if we were gonna think about the human species, seem to go beyond questions of race and gender and um, some of the things that divide 
humans are and maybe how we see the world is less important. Um, and I think, I mean, that, to an extent, I that makes some sense. I mean, so the um, another post-colonial thinker I seem to be drawing a lot on them, uh, Dipesh Chakrabarti makes this argument that um, the one thing about climate change is that that we have to face is that it starts to just shift some of the fundamental categories that we have used by race and class, et cetera, because of the global nature of it. The fact that, and he makes the argument that even the rich can't hide necessarily from climate change, although there's lots of evidence that they do, right? So, you know, so, but he makes this argument that, you know, in a sense, and of course, if we think about it, if we, you know, some of the nightmare scenarios where we hit four or five degrees global warming, um, we're all done, right? I mean, that's like, like it doesn't matter whether you're, you're rich or poor or whatever. But it also struck me, and I'm curious what Helen thinks, that no, none of the questions that we, th we can think about, such as human population or human consumption, can be really understood without a historical perspective that includes a perspective on race and colonialism. And that, so I just, that, that's one thing I don't, and that's, you know, and I'm close to my heart because I'm writing a book on capitalism. But I, you know, you can't, if you look at the kind of facts of history about how we got to the place we got to, like how, how, how did the planet actually warm? How did we start to envelop and destroy whole environments around us? This is actually, it's part, the, the, the story is pretty much about European colonialism turning the planet into a means of extraction to create a global economic system which has basically destroyed the planet. This, the contours of this project were fundamentally racialized. Right? So part of it was about, I mean, the, the basis, the economic basis of this story is dispossessing most of the world um, through this logic of supremacy, white supremacy, forms of forced labour and slavery, which are fundamental to the economic base of the world that we see today, which is they, and they were highly racialized, and the continuing legacy of this racial construction of the world today, so that. The contours of who, and I think Claire's definition, which is fantastic of race, that I've forgotten the scholar that you cited, Claire, but that who gets to live and who gets to die, the conditions of flourishing for populations globally remain highly racialized in the sense that by and large, it's people in the global north who benefit from this, this economic order. Um, while most of the planet faces fundamental poverty, insecurity, et cetera, this is very much tied to rising global living standards in such a way that we, as we know, a small proportion of the planet is responsible for most of the economic and environmental devastation. So again, I don't, it's, I don't know, and so it's not to say that, I, I think I agree that broadly, if we step back and we just look at humanity, Obviously, we need to do something as a human race or whatever, whatever we want to call that, right? But I also just don't, if you drill down into it, I, I can't see how you can tell this story without that historical reality behind it. And I don't think we can even make sense of things like population. I mean, you think about population growth. Um, the actual, when you drill down into it, the reality is it's not necessarily population. It's extraordinarily high living standards and overproduction of goods consumed by people with very high living standards in the global north that's driving many of the problems we're dealing with. So that's the thing I don't quite understand. And I'm curious whether, Helen, you have more to say about it or, um, and I know this is a contentious topic, so, you know, I'm curious what, yeah, whether we can have a conversation about it. Yeah. Um... Well, what I meant was the fact that what happened in the 19th century, perhaps there was an invention that was microscopic, but it changed the 
state of the world and it changed the statistics. It's called uh, antibiotics and it's also called vaccination. Simply put, if you look at the growth in human population since 19th century, in the Second World War, in the First World War, millions of people died, right? My own family would be much bigger if it wasn't for, I come from Russia, if it wasn't for camps, whether it was Stalinist camps or other camps, uh, millions of people died. And yet before Second World War, there were, I've got about 4 billion people on earth. But the thing is, introduction of those antibiotics and um, particularly vaccinations, polio and tuberculosis vaccine, etc., have wiped out the scrooges of humanity, such as cholera, such as, uh, you know, black death. You can think of all these things. Even now, we seem to be triumphant over, you know, with our little COVID vaccine, which was a result of horrendous experiments on billions of mice, rats, and yes, our close relatives, apes. You know that, right? Um, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about almost 8 billion of us. And as I said, yes, some of us consume more than others. And it's not just people in the global north, there are growing middle classes everywhere. And also there's a lot of mixing of this and that. But I think to pretend that even the poorest person who still eats is the same as an ant, you know? Like there are billions of ants on this earth and billions of earthworms. And in biological terms, what they do, they serve an incredibly important function in this world. They actually make the soil that produces plants, etc., etc. They make us alive, all of us. So I think it's a real fallacy not to see the fundamental structural thing, what happens when a large omnivore or apex predator, such as ourselves, and okay, some of us are vegan, many of my friends are vegan, but then again, they might eat something like quinoa, you know, that is flown over from South America or avocado, you know, not exactly a very Dutch thing to eat. You know, it's, there's no limit to, like, if you take any kind of person in any locality and see what they eat per day, just in terms of consumption of whatever. If we had 8 billion, I don't know, any kind of large omnivorous animals on this planet, bears or something like this, don't you think things would be really out of balance? And I honestly don't think it has anything to do with colonialism, um, feminism versus masculinity, whatever. It has to do with the fact that we're animals and we're large and we eat, okay? So it's that simple for me. Claire? Yeah. You're muted, Claire. We cannot hear you. I don't think anyone is denying that we're animals. I think that probably most of us agree with that perspective. But my concern about discussing us, just simplifying things to the extent of saying we're all humans, the 8 billion of us, um, and we're doing, you know, we're using up these resources and affecting animals, is that that strikes me as sort of a liberal universalist fantasy to say we're all humans. Because what we're talking about with colonialism and slavery is the definition of certain populations we know are human as not human, right? And the des that the how that status survives even past centuries of slavery and colonialism into the afterlife life of slavery and colonialism. And and um, so it's simply not true to say that all humans with a small h are designated as human, eight with a capital H, right? So the whole point is 
the differentiation of human populations into those who are recognized as fully human and those who are not recognized as human and often by association with animals, right? They're, they're seen as somehow the missing link or the, you know, the bodies that connect real humans to animals. Um, and so like, if you look at the COVID pandemic, there is, um, on the one hand, there, I think that liberal universalist fantasy comes up again, because one of the reactions early on with COVID was, oh, this is something that's happening to everyone. It sort of shows how we're all vulnerable to disease and it shows how we all are in this together as if we needed to learn that lesson again, right? This is something that is also coming up in ecological discourse about climate crisis and ecological devastation. Um, and yet the, this, at the same time, we're seeing all of the stories that highlight that none of these things falls evenly on different groups, right? The whole point of uh, capitalism working in articulation with race is that, and these are structural features of society. This is not about skin color. This is not about individual characteristics. These are structural forces that shape where things land, how heavily they land, and on whom. Um, and so it's simply not true to say that there's a unitary body of humans that is somehow um, doing things to animals in, in that simplified way. And it goes beyond saying some humans contributed, you know, have a heavier carbon footprint than others. Some are using more electricity than others. It goes beyond that kind of calculation. Um, one of the things that concerns me, and, and actually, Helen, I'm glad you're raising these issues because I have been through some, and Dinesh was with me in the last one, I think, I've been to some symposia where people do not agree on these issues and they kind of suppress the conversation. So I'm really glad that we can talk about these things, uh, you know, maybe not as in depth as we like to, but but at least air them a little. But one of my concerns, um, and, I, and I've and i spoken with Dinesh about this before, is that what's haunting me always in the back of my mind is the threat of eco-fascism, right? Because here we are in a moment, you know, in the United States, and I'm sure many of you in other places feel this as well, where fascism um, is a real, is a, is a live threat, right? It's possible we are sliding, in fact, into a, um, fascist situation politically, and that's not to use histrionic language or anything, but actually to just detail the political dynamics going on here. And what's striking to me is how much the right, the far right, has developed its ideas about nature and animals. And they talk a lot about human populations, you know, um, growing too large and impacting the earth and impacting um, animals. And they take the same language you're using, Helen, but they'll just put race on it, right? They'll say it's the immigrants from Mexico or it's the, you know, other colored, other racialized um, groups of color that are um, growing too large, they're reproducing too much and they're impacting the earth and they're, run, they're using all our resources and we have to keep them out. So we cannot have a discussion about populations, human populations, animals, impact on resources and the earth and leave out race or bracket race because people on the right are having these discussions and they're entirely racialized and, and flagrantly racist. I mean, to the point where they're eco-fascistic. So if we are going to come up with some kind of response to that, if we are going to be alive to that threat, we actually have to talk about race. Helen, you want to respond or Dinesh? You have any thoughts? Well, I wrote a little blog called um, Reversing Eco Fascism. So I guess if you, I, I don't know how to put it in chat. I'm always scared that I'd be called names for just raising these issues. But I'm starting to think also a kind of this bit of group think going on where we repeat each other's uh, words. And um, I'm not right, I'm not left on political spectrum, but I think what's really problematic in this whole discourse that we cannot get past ourselves completely caught up in inter species differences 
in interspecies inequalities and injustices. I care about them as much as you do. I'm woke like you are, but I think it goes too far when we can't even talk about common responsibility, joint responsibility for what we all do, all of us, of all genders and colors. I, look, I don't have much more to add. Um, again, I just I just put put in the chat, you know, fairly recent um, breakdown of um, what we know about responsibility for, um, you know, um, climate change in terms of its relationship to patterns of consumption. And it, from my perspective, I don't so I, I don't see how you can have a unified conversation about something like climate change, unless you deal with the fundamentals of global inequality, unless, it, unless the conversation is tied. And from that respect, you, you can't talk about that without talking about racial differentiation, which is part of the structure of that global inequality. So again, I, I, so, you know, so I can, I can accept the view, and I've said this, like, you know, that, Something like anthropogenic climate change um, is a problem for all of us. I accept that view, but we can't have the conversation without talking about how we're going to move forward together. And that involves dealing with that inequality. Like that's the only way to do it, right? So, I mean, we could, so that to me means it's a conversation about race, right? So, um, and it's a conversation about the historical legacy and what rectifying historical injustice looks like, right? So that, so again, I, I'm not, I, I, and I also, I'm not sure if there's a point in getting into a certain argument that is defensive. So I don't, I don't want to, you know, um, I, I want, prefer to have a productive conversation. Um, but also, I don't know whether I'm necessarily disagreeing, Helen, that this is a conversation we all need to have. I do think it is, but I think to move forward, um, we need to deal with some legacies, right? For me, I really feel that to move forward, we need to accept everybody's responsibility as members of the same species. And I do think there's one humanity, it's called Homo sapiens. And if we see indeed the same idea of, uh, well, what I said with conservation, we're just one out of a million species and we cannot, just cannot seem to put our head around it. It's not just, it's not like if you solve all these issues within our population, within our own population, uh, racism, sexism, I wish they would be solved, of course, inequality, I wish that would be solved, that miraculously 8 billion of us would stop eating animals, would stop using those habitats that used to belong to wildlife, would stop clearing land for agriculture and industrial expansion. But to go back to the point that Dinesh was raising, and it's a strategic point I know that we all agree on, is the necessity of um, trying to move forward together, and I don't just mean us in this symposium, but um, those of us who care about the issues that we care about. Um, one of the things that turns people off animal issues, animal advocacy, environmental advocacy, is its resistance to um, dealing squarely with race. So I understand where you're coming from, Helen, but on a strategic point of view, um, from a strategic point of view, there is a necessity, and this is, you know, Pablo, you wanted me to talk about the ethics of mutual avowal from my book. There is a necessity to acknowledge and recognize, and I know you are in the sense, Helen, that you're saying you, you care about those issues, you know about those issues, but I mean, 
to recognize, you know, um, face to face, movement to movement, advocate to advocate, um, the gravity and urgency of the issues that are being raised so that there can be a mutual avowal. Now, where that goes, I don't know. You know, my preference and my strong belief is that people who are interested in the field we're interested in need to move toward some kind of stronger affiliation with the black liberation struggle. Others may disagree, but the point being that something good can come out of that mutual act of mutual avowal and that the alternative to it is, is disavowal. And um, there are too many people on this earth that we would like to, um, we as animal advocates would like to speak to, would like to reach, would like to be in affiliation with, that are turned off by, um, you know, the resistance to talk about race. So I'll, I'll just leave that there. Maybe switch the conversation to a different question. I do see some interesting stuff in the talk, by the way, in the chat. Um, one is about global inequality is a conversation that terrifies everyone in the global north. And I guess the panel is suggesting that the conversation expands to include our speciesism as well as our racism. I wonder what such a conversation would actually look like in a decision-making policy forum. Yeah, I like this question about policy and uh, what can be done. I do think that one of the win-win scenarios right there is any the rights of uh, women, for example, and also human rights in the context of unwanted pregnancies and in the context of child marriages in countries where at least seven children are expected to be born to a woman. And I think especially in these cases, when we talk about a 12 year old girl having a child, I don't think she has much choice in uh, wanting to. If we see uh, cases in Niger, and again, I say my background is anthropology. I used to look at uh, areas in Africa and uh, Southeast Asia. But uh, yeah, I mean, can we speak about free choice and this great cultural tradition? As I say, 12 year olds getting their babies and then by the age of 18, you have three or four. I'm a mother of three myself, so I'm not, you know, the, the nightmare of every mother is to have her children die. And of course, I love my kids and I want them to live. And they're big consumers just like I am. I mean, we're already doing our best. We don't have a car. We are vegetarians, actually, and uh, a whole bunch of things. But still, we're big consumers, me and my kids. But I think, indeed, the wanted children in the world, that's uh, loved children. That's a very important category of love and life in general. But there is also, and that's again, something that I see as a win-win category in which you can say, well, we can talk of it as cultural differences. Some people uh, find it perfectly fine to marry at the age of 12 to a 60 year old and have all these babies. But, you know, to me, basically the idea of population, voluntary, non-coercive family planning is of paramount of importance as far as policy is concerned, really. Um, and I wish it wasn't just, you know, something that I said from the Netherlands, but uh, something that was recognized in many various different countries. Another thing is, I do think a form of government control centralized government. I don't like the idea of it. I come from the Soviet Union. I've seen that, which was controlling things like consumption, but yeah, controlling things a bit, such as um, a certain production uh, patterns, and also what's available to us as consumers. I think that could be another policy response. And it exists in some countries stronger than others. But yeah, I mean, there are a lot of, um, in economics, for example, theories about degrowth, uh, theories about steady state economics, for example, that also take population pressures and consumption into account. 
So these, to me, would be some of the things that we could address to have a better future for all of us. And by all of us, I don't just mean members of the same species. I really have to stress that this is, to me, the most important thing. I see the world as consisting of brothers and sisters, and I truly, personally, indeed, it surprises me so much how stuck up we are, some of us, in terms of, oh, they're black, or they have a different sexual preference, or it's a woman, you know, it's like, what's the big deal? I never understood it in my head. To me, it's incomprehensible, and also it's incomprehensible how stuck with all this uh, we Helen, are may we, for millennia. It's, it's, we have some other questions. Um, I just wanted to mention about your last point that I don't know how to address this, address this, but something that is constantly coming up is the idea that race and gender are not a matter of just being biologically a woman or having certain skin color. It is something much more, it's as if in a way, when I hear you, I, I feel that it's as if you were talking in a historical terms, as if there was no historical legacy in which there is a certain, for example, a stratification, a certain economic structure, how labor is distributed in terms of social classes racially. So our economic system, one could easily argue, as many of us have argued, is structurally racist, for example. I don't, and sexist. I find it very difficult to just discuss any of the things we are trying to discuss because the talk or the discussion was attempting to be trying to speak conservation with uh, critical race theory, with sort of political theory, critical theory as well, that Ines comes more from that kind of background. But it's a bit difficult to find a meeting point, perhaps. But I would like to ask um, one of the questions that was in the on the YouTube live stream, I believe. Um, Tom Nichols asks, Global inequality is a conversation that terrifies everyone in the global north because the implications are overwhelming. And I guess, I guess the panel is suggesting that the conversation expands to include our speciesism as well as our racism. I wonder what such conversation would actually look like in a decision-making policy forum. So this idea more of a policy that you were discussing as well um, Helen, a little bit, and it's a question that we are quite interested in our think tank. Um, yes, I, I wonder whether you have something to say, Dines and Claire as well. Sure, I don't know what Claire did. You want to go first, or you want me to go first? You go first. The the conversation. So people may know the IPCC released a report two weeks ago which um, kind of just said we're staffed, right? <laughs> it's, it was pretty grim reading. The conversation that is missing, that I see globally that is missing is what large scale structural changes do we need to make to avert catastrophe? And the, from this standpoint, and different commentators have made this point that we're at an odd time in history where we've seen the absolute victory of market models of society and, and economies in such a way that it's almost unspeakable to talk about alternatives. Just at the point where capitalism is just completely destroying the planet and there's no conversation about the alternatives. From that standpoint, I just think this is the urgent task for all of us is to put this in the spotlight and shape the conversation. As we've been talking about, it's not the, the conversation about what is the what are the structural changes we need to make. Uh, actually, it's actually the conversation about what do we want, what sort of society do we want moving forward, and how do we resolve the fundamental inequalities that have structured this society. And this is why I would, I would always say this is actually, it's a conversation about race, it's a conversation about gender, it's actually, it's a conversation about the, the kind of democratic society that we want. Maybe to rephrase, and, and, and hopefully I think it's in agreement with what Helen has said, I think the kind of society and economy that we want 
is one that is aimed at co-flourishing. And this means a society that allows humans to flourish, but not at the expense of everyone else or every other being or, or other natures. So I'm really interested in the idea of what would it mean to have a conversation about a flourishing human society, one that is more equal, that simultaneously allows other species, other non-humans to flourish at the same time. What does that look like? It certainly doesn't look like, so the model of economy that we have today is one where um, we ransack everything around in order to turn that into money for a small group of people. That's the, that's the, the recipe for our economy. So my interest is how do we get a radical conversation back in the room about how do we restructure economies? But once again, I'd agree with Claire that you can't have this conversation without talking about fundamental, the fundamental structures of inequality on our planet, which includes race. And so race is part of the legacy of capitalism and it will be part of the future unless we actually talk about it. Right? So that's, that's, that's why it's an important conversation. Yeah, thank you so much, Dinesh, for bringing up capitalism again and thinking, proposing that we try to think about alternatives to it and using the word radical, because it really seems, you know, as the years go by, it's clearly becoming more and more urgent that we turn to um, the roots of the problem, right? Um, that we think radically in the sense of turning to the roots of the problem and thinking outside of the normal frameworks and indeed outside of like the question how would it sound in the policy making forum? Because to me, when, you know, as a political scientist, I'm often asked this question. And to me, that immediately sort of narrows things down in a way and says, well, would this fly with, you know, your local legislator in the state, leg in the Kansas, you know, yeah, how assembly? And, you know, to me, that question is already sort of narrowing what we can think about and what we can say. And what we need to be doing is really dramatically broadening. Um, our ability to to um, theorize in new directions um, and hence my you know um, inclination to that people who are interested in these issues um, are, start to take more seriously the black liberation struggle so i wanted to raise an issue that i think is somewhat related i don't know if it's going to be clear how, how it's related but thinking about conservation as a field of study or field of practice um, and I'm sure this is going on, the, this topic is being discussed within conservation. I just don't know that literature, so I'm interested in hearing um, what you all have to say about it. Conservation um, is backward looking in one sense, right? It's trying to restore, or recuperate, or conserve. It's not looking toward the future in that sense. Um, and it also depends upon a somewhat arbitrary fixing of a line, right, of a moment of origins, right? So, you know, Pablo, you're talking about invasive species. In order to talk about a species as invasive, you have to have some idea of what was there before and when that, you know, cohered as an ecosystem and when that began, right? So it's all very arbitrary where we draw those lines. The same is true of the human community too. So the whole, does the whole conservation set of discourses rely upon the designation of an arbitrary moment of origins? Um, and does it, is it backward looking? Um, is there discontent within conservation about these, this, the sort of imperative to recuperate or restore as opposed to look for in a forward direction? Um, and I think this ties into what Dinesh is saying because um, without rethinking about how to restructure our economy, without thinking about how to revitalize our democracy, which at least in the United States is very much in danger, um, and without thinking about those larger structural issues, um, which are you know in, on which we are going in the wrong direction in recent decades, then it's hard to see how we can ever, as a species, alongside other species, um, survive what what is coming in the uh, next few next several decades. Helen, perhaps you have a response to this or no well i was just clicking through other comments as well and uh, there are mm. a lot of insightful ideas over there 
Mm. So uh, about the arbitrary moment of origin, yeah, I just wanted to mention very briefly, I thought perhaps you would mention this, Helen, that in many cases, and particularly in Australia, that I know that context well, relatively well, um, the point is the point of colonization. So that's the moment when we established the, the also are the beings who are native, and then the ones, the species that were introduced are usually regarded as invasive, although not only um, there are invasive species that um, might not treat that kind of that kind of schema. But um, yeah, the point, point of colonization when Europeans, European settlers arrived to Australia, in the case of Australia, tends to be one of those things, which is indeed arbitrary. Why should we draw the line there? And also economic interests are very important here because, for instance, domestic animals who could be regarded as the most invasive if one wanted to be consistent uh, in factory farms, they are not, not regarded as invasive. And something that, Helen, you were discussing before, I thought that maybe you would mention this, um, you were going to mention this, we humans, are not labeled as invasive either, right? Which is uh, which is relatively interesting, I believe, because we meet the definition when one looks at, you know, harming a lot, if you like, ecosystems, ecologies being really uh, harmful in that regard. And especially Western practices are incredibly harmful uh, when it comes to fossil fuels and factory farming, it's a huge issue. Um, so yeah. I thought that maybe you, you had some comments on this, but as you were saying, uh, Helen, there are very interesting questions. So let me ask one by Delcia Winders, Delcia Winders, who I, I really like this question. Thank you very much um, for putting it forth. And she says um, that 15 years ago, um, uh, when I, Delcia, when I was a teaching assistant for Derek Bell, who is credited as the father of critical race theory, I asked him to engage publicly in a discussion about black rights and animal rights. He declined saying, quote, I have doubts whether this is a good idea and fear that any possible relationships between the two movements can easily be manipulated, but this is still quite racist society, end quote. I don't think he was wrong about our society or the manipulation. But I also think having these discussions is important. Do you have thoughts on navigating this tension? And I, I like this question because I thought it reminded me a lot to your work on an ethic of mutual avowal, Claire, that I think is really brilliant. But all of you, I, I, I would really like to hear what you think about this. You know, I just feel that today in Western world, at least, I think being a racist is definitely not something acceptable. It happens. All kinds of discrimination. I just want to read a little extract here from a newspaper I found. It's called a black star who dazzled with acts in white circus. New York Times International Edition, July 29, 2021. So picture of a black star in a white circus. And the idea goes like this. So she was the first that wasn't exhibited in the circus as a curiosity because she was black. She was actually an active participant and a famous actress, let's put it this way in the circus. So her riding feet on a full grown beast was considerably more daring than uh, Mr. Dawn's casual stroll. For one thing, the elephants were not strolling as she described them in an oral history. The number was called the cakewalk jamboree and the elephants would come galloping out, she said, adding, and then they would stand on their hind legs so that you were on the elephants and you were way up. And then the elephants would pivot eastward into a headstand, the rider rocketing forward with her animal. In other circuses, a rider might grab the harness to maintain balance, but not in the ringing area. Photographs from the time show Miss Brown triumphantly astride her headstanding elephant, arms raised high, her elaborate headdress perfectly in place blah, blah, blah. And then uh, 
She was dismayed at the animal rights protest that cast the circus in a bad light in years later. Anyway, the whole article is about um, liberation of uh, black, et cetera, et cetera. The entire argument, and if you guys any, know anything about training elephants for particularly the kind of tricks that you just heard about, headstands, etc., it evolved incredibly cruel treatments, electric shocks, etc. And this is a newspaper from now, it's this year. So we see no problem at all with the idea, and actually um, animal rights activists are cast as, well, really annoying people. I've read some more interviews on the subject, and that's one of those things that just bothers me a lot, you know, because this is still seen as normal. So I'd like to respond to the comment about Derek Bell. Um, in particular, I've been thinking a lot about Derek Bell because of the attacks by the right wing in the United States on so-called critical race theory, however they're designating that, um, by which I think they mean the truthful telling, recounting of U.S. history. Um, but I, what's interesting about Derek Bell's response to that comment, Delcy, is that there's no um, rejection of the animal issue. Right, there is no rejection of um, what links the black issue the, or the racial issue to the animal issue. It's more a concern about what ill-intended people will do with that connection, right? And so this is what I was referring to before about the use of animalization in racializing slaves and racializing in particular black people. Now, all, all people of color in the U.S have been animalized to some degree, but I'm talking about something that's really singular and distinctive with the black population and continues to this day. Um, and so there is a hesitation and a, a skepticism and a worry among people involved in the black struggle that any mention of the animal issue um, will sort of immediately rekindle that association between blackness and animality that um, that has been so devastating, um, and so the um, you do see a lot. Of, what one thing I found very exciting is that there are more and more young African American scholars like um, Joshua Bennett and Afco and Silco and Alexis Gums and others who are really taking this um, idea of the the co constitution of blackness and animality and investigating it historically and speaking from people within the black struggle about their concerns about um, the exploitation and instrumentalization of animals. So I think that's a very powerful development. And, um, but again, going back to my concern about strategic alliances and strategic affiliations, right? If, if a person who's, who's at all skeptical, who, who understands the black struggle, and who is at all skeptical of animal or environmental people listens in in a conversation where there's just this this flat out rejection of dealing with um, the urgency of racial issues. Then the tendency is to again separate the two issues and say I don't want to bring those two together um, because other people, right, white people are bringing them are are are, um, are saying you know are defining animal and environmental issues in a way that is sort of palpably identifiably white. And so my concern is how do we increase communication, right, between different groups of people who have a common interest in environmental issues, who have a common passion for animals, but, you know, need to be able to speak to one another. And I think, you know, this is sort of going back to some things you were saying, Dinesh. Dinesh, would you like to say something? Or, yeah, I'm also uh, conscious of time, so I don't know whether I mean, worry. Do you want to get to another question or no, no, I think we will close here because it's a bit late in Europe. So please say whatever you want, Dinesh, and then we will close uh, because I we just, also have to say some other things. Just to build on what Claire said, um, people, I think, um, and this is about thinking conceptually about how do we make change and what solidarity looks like. People often assume that the basis for solidarity is that you have, you are the same, 
Right. So I'm the same as this person, therefore. And actually, I think this is actually one of the problems that has shaped the, the historical debate around race and animals is um, some of the clumsy and quite problematic work that was done within animal liberation discourse, um, basically saying, well, um, animals are owned as property, um, Slaves were owned as property. Therefore, if you oppose slavery, therefore you should oppose. Right? So assuming that actually there's something going on that's the same, um, which of course there's not. Like historically, we can really, if you understand, actually there's, there's important differences and resonances and you need to actually understand the nuances. Um, a different way of thinking about solidarity is where are we going? And that's actually the hard work. So the hard work is, can we agree about where we're going and work with different political constituencies on a shared project together? To me, this is for, if I, if I was going to say that I think one of the challenges for animal, animal liberationists is to what extent are animal liberationists willing to work with other groups and other social movements to notice their shared interests and also articulate the shared vision for where they're going. Um, something Claire and I have spoken about is the fact that if you look at the events of the last two years, perhaps the most radical movements that have been happening globally have actually been movements mobilised around race, i.e. Black Lives Matters. Right? Um, so in a sense, one question for the animal liberation movement is what is what is the position of this movement in relation to BLM? And of course, I'm collapsing animal liberation. There's multiple different constituencies within that space. To me, that's the question of solidarity, is to what extent can we articulate a shared vision for a society, articulate our shared interests and move forward together with different groups who are also interested in a radical transformation of society. Um, so to me, that's a different way of thinking about solidarity. And it also avoids the old question of saying, oh, hey, you, you look like you have the same interests as me, you should be in solidarity with me. That doesn't make any sense. To me, solidarity is the political project of disparate groups finding a common goal and working together towards that goal. Thank you very much, Dinesh. That's a wonderful place to close our conversation. Um, let me, yes, what I want to do before we finish is first, I want to say a few links for, because we have many events coming over the next month or so. I'm going to share here our next conversation on the chat and all the events that we are having. Um, there it is on the chat. And yes, um, so the third animal conversation that we are going to have is with Chloe Taylor and Kelly Struthers Montfort or on animals, colonialism and disability, the 15th of October. So we are going to look at some of the themes and issues that um, Dines and Claire were discussing, and also in relation to disability that Dines is an expert on, you, you might wish to also check out his work on that. And the next event of our program is happening this very week, actually, on Friday, the 17th of September. It's called Listening to the Zoo. Then at the end of September, the 30th of September, we have a roundtable on the legal personhood of non-human animals in Latin America, which will be happening in Spanish, for those of you who are not, not English native speakers. And the 6th of October, we'll have a book talk with Professor Menisha Deca on her book, Animals as Lingual Beings, Contesting Anthropocentric Legal Orders. Again, some of the things that Dinesh and Clay were discussing, especially what Clay means by the human with capital H, we are, is going to come up in this book talk as well with uh, Menisha Deca, who has discussed extensively about this matter in relation to the law. So then um, Helen, Claire and Dinesh, I would like when, before we finish, if you could tell us where people can reach you if they want to do so and find more information as well about your work. Um, if people want to find my stuff, I've got a, a profile page at the University of Sydney and my email address is there. So people are welcome to drop me a line if you want to have a chat. Senior for the um, UCI University of California Irvine. <laughs>
I'm on the, the political science um, web page. I, I've just posted a link to my research, basically. And I'm based in two places at the same time, which makes me very tired indeed. I'm presently working eight days a week and I've slept for about five hours in the last two days. And I'm afraid tomorrow morning I'm teaching at 8.30. So I'm really not findable in terms of responding to emails too quickly because I just need to catch up with pretty much my life. <laughs> but I would love to receive any kind of responses later on or I can answer them later on. I'll just write my email in chat. Thank you very much, Helen. And also thank you very much for the, I know that it's super late in the Netherlands where you're based is 20 to one. So thank you for being with us until the end. And thanks to all of you. It was my pleasure. For, <laughs> thank you. And thank you very much to all of you for all your contributions and this discussion, which it was at some moments tense, but um, I think there were interesting aspects and a lot to learn from it. So thank you very much to all of you for, for being with us. It's been a, a true honor to have you. Um, and then I always, as for people who, had, who came to the previous conversation with Lori Gruen, I like to finish our conversations by reading one quote, but I'm helpless with this. So I ended up writing two or three quotes here that I would like to read to all of you and kind of paraphrase some bits. And the first one is by Achille Mbembe, who argues in the book On the Postcolony that to defer in a postcolonial context from something or somebody is not simply not to be like in the sense of being non-identical or being other, it is not to be at all, non-being, which relates a lot, I think, to some of the insights Dines was saying now at the end in relation to sameness logics that have been very prevalent in the animal movement and animal ethics in particular. I also thought that these words were pertinent because when animals are categorized as invasive feral pest or their activities are, are literally, literally regarded as a threat in policy documents and legislation, legislation, animals are epistemically erased. And this connects quite nicely, I thought, with one of my favorite quotes in, of course, racism as zoological witchcraft, where she says that, con quote, conceptual violence precedes physical violence. You must be thought of as an inferior subject before your body is used, abused, manipulated, and consumed, close quote. And the last quote I wanted to read is by our inaugural speaker of this conversation series, Lori Gruen, who we had the honor to have uh, last month. And in the book, Animal Ladies, Lori Gruen says, I worry that too often we take the possibility that we cannot fully understand as an excuse to not even try to take the perspective of another. Entangled empathy in, in, involves moral attention. It involves working through complicated processes of understanding one another and other animals in situations of differential social, political, um, and species power. So I wanted to read um, this last quote because to me, it has always resonated a lot with Claire's work uh, as, to which I have referred multiple times, the ethic, the idea of an ethic of mutual avowal, because clay kind of impels us to turn towards animals, to be attentive to others and try to understand the specific context, the nuances and the plurality and the massive differences that there are. Yeah. Um, and also to many of the things that perhaps we are also connect us. So hopefully we have seen some of these um, similarities and difference maybe. But anyways, I think I'm going to leave it there now as well, because I'm also quite tired. Once more, Claire, Ines, and Helen, thank you very much for being with us. It's been an honor. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very so, much for organizing it. It has been an honor. Thank you. And um, yes, I just, bye everybody. I really hope to see you the 15th of October on our third conversation on disability, colonialism, and animals. More to follow. Bye. Okay, thank you. Bye.